So we're, we're we're rolling. Let's move these waters out of my way, so that way my face looks pretty. I'm gonna I'm gonna start with a little glass glass hit just to see how that that calms the vibe. People are writing you. I think you have some fans over there. All right, hourglass has started. Hourglass has started. We're officially the going. Hour, the great hourglass, dude. So uh, I feel so incredibly grateful to be here right now. This is like. I was just cruising through the whole on it lab situation and just seeing everybody putting together articles about how to make your life better and having everybody in this one concentrated place on how to sort yourself out. It's fucking incredible, man. So first, thanks for having me here. I appreciate it. Um, this morning, I started my day off freezing my testicles off inside your meat freezer in your garage filled up with water. I did about eight minutes as I listened to a guy called David Data talk about sexual, spiritual relationships. See, you, that's what I was going to, I was wondering. Because everybody's like, man, I set the timer and then, you know, this loud alarm goes off. And I'm, I always listen to music. So I'll, I'll say, I'll find a song that I want to listen to. And I'll look at the length of that song. And if, you know, if I know, say it's at 30 degrees and I can only hit five minutes, I'll find a five minute song that's really inspirational. And then if it's... Uh, if I'm if I'm ballsy and I want to do, you know, seven to ten minutes, then I'll get a longer song. Maybe, maybe, um, Nako the Bear, Aloha Keakua, something like that. You know, a longer track that's super inspirational that that I really can be motivated by. And then that length of that song is going to be long, but I listen to that one song, or I'll pick two songs if I'm going to do a little longer set. Yeah. And yeah. then when the music's over, then it's time to get out. Yeah. So what is what has that? So for the first time. I am, I've always been sold on the idea of cold water thermogenesis. I've just kind of more come from the place of, I want to jump in the ocean. I want to go surf. I want to jump in a lake. I want to jump in a river. Uh, the whole idea of buying 40 pounds of ice, bring it to your house. You waste so much plastic. Like there's so much to lose in that. But now I got the freezer idea, you know? So I'm curious, like from, from your perspective, how is that? What's the value in, in sitting in the cold for you? Well, it's a lot of things. Obviously, I got turned on a Wim Hof from the Joe Rogan experience and Tim Ferriss. And, um, you know, there's a ton of science that goes into that. Lowered inflammation. Uh, it burns fat, which is a cute little accessory. It's a nice side effect. Uh, staying, an easy way to stay lean. But really a driving factor for me personally has been mitochondrial health. And so I told you I had done my telomeres test. I listened to uh, Ben Greenfield. Had this guy on who tests telomere length through uh, white blood cells just a finger prick, you know, they mail it to you, you mail it back to them and they could tell you your biological age versus your chronological age. Now telomeres and mitochondria aren't the same thing, but the health of your cells, the health of mitochondria, they all work synergistically and, and hand in hand with how your body's doing, right? So anything that I can benefit, that's why a lot of these products now that are focusing on longevity focus on mitochondria. So what are the hacks that I can do without purchasing stuff? Cause I'll buy the fucking supplements. Yeah. But what are the things I can do aside from that fasting? intermittent fasting, ketogenic diet, which I'll do during the winter months of the year, uh, hot and cold therapy is really exceptional for that. And then various forms of exercise. But if I can, if I do like the cryotherapy, we have one of those here, it works pretty well. But if I hit three minutes, which is the max session, 10 minutes later, it's like, I didn't, I never even fucking got in. The I don't cold. get that much. If I do three, three minutes in 35 degree water, it's going to take me the better part of an hour to feel normal again. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna have to focus on deep Wim Hof breathing. I'm gonna have to jump on the, on the trampoline to get the rebounding going to pump blood through my body. Whatever the case is, I gotta fucking move more to stimulate my body to pull itself out of that hole. And in doing that, that strengthens the mitochondria. Ultimately, hopefully, it's going to add to my longevity and help reverse some of this aging that I have because I'm chronologically, my, my, my age, I've circled the sun 35 times biologically i'm 41 years old hmm. that's a fucking problem to me hmm. right and that could be from getting hit in the head all those years in the ufc that could be from all my partying at asu and after in my fight career it could be all of the things but regardless of what it is now with the focus more geared towards longevity than performance since i retired a few years ago and obviously being at on it, being director of human optimization, like this is shit that I have to learn for the job, but it's also things that fascinate me. And so any little trick of the trade that I can figure out 
Uh, I want to have that for myself. And I also want to be able to extrapolate that out to the masses. So what's the ease of use that can get people to do something every day? Well, I, I bought a horse trough off Amazon for 190 bucks, pretty cheap buy. Then I had to buy eight to 10 bags of ice every day. Every time I want to use it, it's 40 to 60 bucks. I'm lugging giant bags of ice that are fucking soaking the back of the minivan. Yep. All the plastic you mentioned. And it only stays cold for one session, right? It's not even that cold for my wife going second, you know? So uh, Matt Vincent and Dr. Kelly Surrett told me about this, this little hack with uh, the standalone chest freezer, a meat freezer. And you can find them on Craigslist for dirt cheap. Unfortunately, in Austin, as I was telling you, everybody hunts. So nobody's selling their chest freezer on Craigslist. But Black Friday, they had a deal, brand new, 20 cubic foot. I'm, you know, we're close to the same height. I'm 6'3". I'm You're a bit taller, but I can lay down in that thing. Yeah. And, you know, I plug it in just for a few hours a day or every other day even. And that thing will hover between 25 and 40 degrees. All, all time, you know, very time efficient. You know, some people say like, well, you want it around 50 to 55, then you can stain it longer and you're doing the breath work. But it's like, well, if I do it for five minutes and I'm frozen getting out of that thing, I'll start to, there's a delayed response with my body. I'll start to shiver when I get out, not when I'm in it. And so that takes mindfulness in the breath work and in charging my system up. And if I can do that, do it that way and pull myself out rather than let me go jump in a hot shower to cheat my system from yeah. fighting its way out of the hole, that's when I experience the most benefit. And yeah. it works on everything from systemic inflammation. Like I feel it like how and how I recover from workouts. I also feel it in mental clarity. Uh, something that kind of goes unnoticed in doing this is the meditative benefits of it. Like you cannot think about anything else. Your whatever shit's going on in your brain when you get in the cold, it's gone. All you're doing is focusing on your breathing, slowing it down, trying to relax. And I think that's another thing to point out to people is you don't do Wim Hof breathing when you're in the ice. You're not huffing and puffing away. You're trying to slow things down, get into a parasympathetic state. It makes things worse. And just be zen in it, right? Yeah, you don't want to panic in there. You want to get calm and quiet in there. And if you can achieve that, you can stay in much longer, right? Yeah. And then you'll see more benefit. I want to poke at that. And then I want to rewind back just a little bit because you'd mentioned the whole uh, telomere age, biological age versus linear time timeline age. And there's a, a really fascinating study by a woman called Ellen Langer who has been on this podcast. Uh, I highly recommend people jump back, check her work out in general. I recommend you get into her on the On It podcast as well. Uh, she's got a thing called counterclockwise. She also has a book called Counter counterclockwise. And in that study, she's a Harvard professor. Uh, she brought, I think it was, I don't remember how many people, a, a, a ton of like around 80 year old folks brought them into this house, rewound the clock back 20 years, changed the photos, changed the newspaper, changed the music, made the I whole heard thing. of this recently. So cool. Right. And so we're, we essentially create this artificial world where it's okay. It's 20 years ago. They got the Super Bowl from 20 years ago, the whole thing. And what they found with that, people are playing, playing like it's 20 years ago, acting with each other and reminiscing. And their fingers got longer. Arthritis starts to decrease. Their spines get longer. Their vision increases. Their balls pulled back up. Their balls, their boners got harder. Everything. I don't know about the boner part. Maybe. Well, the balls might have retracted, <laughs> right? No, there's no. It's scientifically proven. Old men balls sag down to their knees. That's, that's science. That's science. Yeah. You know, but so all this stuff happened. Their 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 cells were listening to their outlook on on reality. You know, and I, I wonder, it kind of hits me as you're saying that. You're like, oh, God, my telomeres, I'm 41 years old. Fuck. I wonder if there's some type of maybe placebo you know, effect with Well, that. I just found this out. So it's not like I've been living my life as an old man. I just want, um, just as a conversation point. No doubt, no of, doubt. And I just, I, you know where I heard this? It was in a great book called The Mind Body Code. Um, forget the name of the guy, but The Mind Body Code. It's an exceptional piece. It kind of talks quite a bit about... Um, well, obviously mind and body and how they correlate with one another, but they talked about this study in there. And um, I think what they had, the model they had used was they took everyone back to the 1950s. And so it was all 1950s cars, all 1950s food, all 1950s videos, uh, newspaper and movies. And um, one group, they had actually live as if they were in the 50s. So they did all the things they did. They went to the movies, they saw the old films, they, they lived it. Other people went back to that place and they only reminisced about how great the 50s were. They're only allowed to talk about it. 
And the people that spoke about it and were reminiscent actually aged faster. Mm. All their symptoms worsened because they were looking in the past in a lovingly way, like, oh, those are the best times of my life, Whoa. instead of embodying that youthful era in their lives, right? So that blew me away, that difference, right? Because there's a number of things we can do to act and feel different. And and maybe it is, like we spoke about earlier on on it, you know, a fake it till you make it scenario, like, yeah, my fucking knee hurts. Well, I can kind of grind through that, but ultimately I may pay the piper for that if I'm not careful. But this act of moving and being more free or doing the things that I used to do that remind me of being young and remind me of being more free, those would ultimately have that benefit, mm. you know? And certainly with, I mean, there's, there, I'll, I'll put it this way, you know, when we go back to the telomere length, whatever this thing says now about my current state of telomeres doesn't mean shit to me because ultimately I bought, I bought a two pack and <laughs> uh, I'll see the results of the changes I make in the next however long, six months to a year and retest. And I'll watch that thing drop more towards, if not right to my chronological age. And then down the road, when I'm actually 41, maybe it'll say that I'm 35, hmm. you know? So I have that outlook, you know, I don't have this, oh man, I'm old and withered and who know what happened when I was blowing rails and staying up all night or, or getting punched in the head or whatever I did to accelerate aging at this point it's it, we're all fluid you know nothing is stagnant yeah everything can be changed for the better and certainly with um the more these things become easy to do right like the cold bath or you know we have a, a double sauna here that's hot gets up to 220 degrees and it's also infrared far near and mid one of the best saunas i've ever been to not that it matters or relevant to like pump up on it but they're so all good yeah they're all good and oftentimes I, you know, saunas aren't hot enough i wouldn't i wouldn't fucking I'm not going to lie and say like, yeah, I'd have one of these at my house. If I was like, no, I'm not going to afford a $10,000 sauna at the house. So I'm, I very much am privileged to be able to use this thing daily while I'm on the clock, mind you. Yeah. But that said, like I can go back and forth between these things and the cold for, for 500 bucks, like I'll never buy a bag of ice again for a cold bath and it's energy star efficient. It's not, it doesn't cost a lot in electricity because it's only plugged in a few hours, you know, every other day. Yeah. And, um, what an amazing biohack to throw out a term that a lot of people have a knee-jerk reaction with. But I mean, if you think of true, like how you hack the body and make it work, like that's an incredible way to do that. Yeah, that's, so I have, I, that my tendency is to have some resistance around biohacks in quotations that end up kind of just taking you out of your life, you know, and it ends up being expensive and ends up being wasteful oftentimes. And a lot of times we're living, I just re well I listened to this book called You Are the Placebo by Joe Dispenza. So it's his most um, recent book. Okay. I just listened to, uh, what is it? Uh, Breaking the Habit of Being Yourself. Being Yourself. And then I have the hardcover for Becoming Superhuman or mm. Becoming Supernatural. Becoming Supernatural. Becoming Supernatural. Yeah. So in the, in the, the, you are the placebo book, it's, it does really good at, at breaking down various different case studies around how our thoughts really do control us at a, at a, at a biological level. Like one of the things, a few of the things, one of which was asthma, people that take uh, placebo asthma inhalers, they end up, it ends up being just as effective. Another mm -hmm. thing was poison ivy. Right, you mentioned like getting poison ivy recently, which I think there are. Anytime we're talking about placebo stuff, I think there is also there's the other parts where it's like this. It really does interact outside of your thoughts, and I think on top of that, we have a lot more control than we actually believe, you know. But in that, it just goes through all of these different case studies of we're controlling way more than what we what we think, and so I always have suspicion around things that tell you that you're worse off than you are especially when they're potentially selling a line of supplements that go with it because i think that it's kind of like we're always casting spells on each other you know and so when yeah. you get that report card you're like oh no this is going to cost ten thousand dollars yeah yeah it puts well, you in a different place and that's something just to just to go back i mean that's something i'm constantly telling people because we do face i do facebook lives uh twice a week for on it and we it's a really it's a q a for 30 minutes and um you know, we get so many questions on Alpha Brain, which is our flagship product at Onnit, and uh, other nootropics. And I've experimented with quite a few nootropics. But the truth is, there's no fucking supplement that can f fix a shitty diet. If you have brain fog, yeah. if you're tired constantly, if your adrenals are fucked, 
you know, sleeping well, taking rest, meditating, eating well, lowering your carbohydrates during the day, all can have a dramatic impact on cognitive improvement and energy, brain energy, really. So, I mean, everybody that's trying to fix this with a pill, it ain't going to work. Now, if your brain is doing fairly well and you're fairly happy with your diet and everything that's going on, your movement practice, your sleep hygiene, then you add that on top of it, that's where you see the beauty of it. Mm. You know, you don't want, you don't want to uh, rely on a supplement or any product to dig you out of a hole or to lean on as a crutch for the rest of your life. As far as guinea pigs go, you're like, at this point with this new role here at the audit, you're like at level with Ben Greenfield, I would say. And I'm trying. I'm in, Ben's, only, I'm in Ben's ear all, all the time. I'm like pretty gnarly in the realm what, of, of guinea pig. What can I do to myself outside of injecting my dick with stem cells <laughs> from a pig? Because uh, he'll do the things that I won't. Yeah. You know, not that I wouldn't do that, but but you know, I mean, uh, Ben's in a league of his own when it comes to the human guinea pig stuff. I yeah. get to do some really cool stuff, and and um, what's fun too with being director of human optimization that's nice is uh everyone here when they hear something cool new or weird they send it my way first they're like oh you got to talk to kyle about that you know i mean even today we had this um this new pemf device pulse electromagnetic frequency come in, come through and the guy uh he's worked with dave asprey in the past he's a certified biohacker if whatever that means but i mean he he has a wealth of knowledge and he works with a very good company for pulse electromagnetic frequency, something I've been into for a while. I read the body electric and pulse electromagnetic frequency, the book. I want to get the book healing is voltage. I've heard Joe Mercola, I guess you've had on a couple of times and a lot of other people talk about it. So there's, there's definitely something to that. And I felt the benefits from a biomat and other things like that, but yeah, it was cool. This guy brought a $38,000 machine, something that I'm not going to own, but maybe on it could, right? So do we have a use for that? Well, certainly with our partnership with Exos, with the amount of professional athletes we have rolling through here, there's no doubt we could have a market for that. And then with that, can I get greedy and get a piece of that? Can I get on that every day? Hell yeah. You yeah. know, so so there's, there's a lot of cool shit. Um, thankfully, the things that I've experimented with have not had any deleterious effects to my knowledge. Does anything stand out for you as far as the things that you've guinea pigged? As far as yeah, like, like um, get it at home. No one's going to get a thirty-eight thousand dollar PMF machine, but unless you are, you know, grab it. But yeah, I did. Um, so we were working with a guy, Dr. Craig Conover, with Fast Vitamin IV, who's based out of North Carolina. He's going to partner with Onnit, and we're going to start doing vitamin IV pushes. And one of the things that he does outside of glutathione and a lot of the cool shit is he does NED Plus therapy. Now, it ain't cheap. It's $300 a whack. Um, it feels like someone has their hand inside your stomach and is squeezing and twisting. Mm. Um, but it is absolutely cutting edge. There's no human studies done yet. There's a lot of studies done on rats and mice. So maybe I'm one of the first N equals one studies. But Ben Greenfield swears by this. Um, to name drop a bit, the first time we got to do this, I was with Lance Armstrong, Tim Ferriss, and a few others, a couple of Lance's teammates. And uh, we all get to chum it up and become buddies. But, you know, when I see Tim Ferriss, who's also, you know, a self-experimenter sitting across from me, who, you know, he recently moved to Austin, I feel like I'm in good company. I'm like, all right, this guy's not going to roll the dice. You know, he's definitely more health oriented. I, I said, sure, sign me up. It no. has the potential to do a lot of things for longevity. Tim would never roll the dice on his health. I don't think he's no not rolling no the chance. dice. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, but, uh, but I will, you know, yeah. and, that, and that's okay. Um, I, th I think that, Looking at things, what's cool is I had this telomere test done prior to that therapy and then now going forward with it and along with all the other things that I'm going to do towards that, you know, including, you know, the, the most low tech thing possible, a seven day water fast I want to do this year. I got five days uh, in 2015, didn't quite get to seven. Dominic D'Agostino inspired me to do that. So there's a lot of low tech free shit you can do that has a dramatic impact on the body on cellular turnover, apoptosis. Obviously, Dr. Rhonda Patrick has made that fairly popular with having guests on like Sachin Panda and different people, Falter Longo. So I think that with all this information that I get to absorb, uh, it's again, it's about putting it into practice. And some of the best things aren't fun. It's, it's not exactly fun to sit in 30 degree water. It's not fun to go without food for four days or longer. And it's, it's, it's not fun to have someone squeezing your stomach and turning it for an hour. Mm. But in all those things, 
Um, and I don't want to live longer. I'm not trying to live to 200, but I'm also, I want to live the best I can be for as long as I can be. And I think I owe that to my kids and my kids' kids and really to stay as mentally sharp as I can. So that way, as I gather this information and put it into practice, that it's not lost as I age. Alzheimer's runs on my dad's side of the family. And it's, that's something that got me into keto, you know, I mean, reading books like Green Brain and, and uh, Brain Maker by Dr. David Perlmutter. It's a big issue and it, and it runs on my family. I have one genetic mutation for ApoE4. And so those are things that kind of fuel that, you know, and then I also, my mom's side of the family of type two diabetes, told you I'm pre-diabetic when I looked at my blood glucose levels doing the wired to eat protocol with Rob Wolf. So there's a lot of shit that drives me personally. That's very much has to do with me personally. And then there's other stuff that just, I think is, is good for the masses. And I want to be the first to, to jump on that before I say, Hey, you should try this. I was looking at something yesterday upon writing an article about uh, walking movement and exercise and how it affects cognitive function and one of the things was uh, they were they were uh, working with people that had probably the same genetic situation and what they found was the people that ended up pursuing these programs of exercise and movement and dance and such they ended up having um, significantly less chances of actually having any cognitive decline and then also reversing any cognitive decline you know, so again, I think it's like we come back into trying to do all these amazing biohacks and this and that. And sometimes it's just like a dance class away, you know, or mm -hmm. also there was a, there was another thing I promised to get out of like study territory in a second because I want to just have like a heart to heart. But uh, there was a, a study in Japan where they were tickling rats or mice. And what they found with that was they ended up actually just through tickling these rats. I think it was like four hours a day or it was for four days. And they found that it ended up increasing neurogenesis, which at one point we thought well, like we can't create new neurons. And uh, that's when we were young. And they're like, you th "Be careful with your head. You only get so many brain cells before yeah, you die." Right? Exactly. Yeah. Like, what a shitty situation. Yeah. So Why is that you different than every fall other out of a wagon? You're body. like, "Well, that sucks." Yeah. You know, but so these little like silly what we would just so easily just kind of kind of uh you know forget about it's like have a laugh go have a dance go have a run all of that taps right into the mainframe of all this stuff that we're getting real smart and getting into all the nooks and crannies the biohacks but most of those in my experience are kind of trying to get back at that genuine experience of going out and having a surf or dancing or having some sex or having a genuine connection having a laugh what about the fasting with the was there any other effects with the fasting outside of like mm, observable data like how did it make you feel yeah so one thing i noticed was you know obviously the digestive system takes quite a bit of resources and we're we constantly eat our, our eating window is not natural right so that's one of the reasons there's a ton of research coming in on 16 hour fast, eight hour feeding window, the opposite of a typical standard American diet, 16 hour eating window, eight hour fast while you sleep. Huge benefit there. That's something I do year round. But um, when I did, I was shooting for the seven day fast, ended up only doing five. Um, <clears throat> I noticed cognitively, I wasn't, I couldn't read books. I couldn't, I couldn't really stay sharp and focused on certain tasks, mm. but daydreaming was extremely productive i was highly creative hmm. uh things ideas and things that i've been working on for a long time i was finding answers to it was almost like i had cleared this this space to think outside the box but if i wanted to narrow it down and put blinders on i didn't have the ability to do that and that that kind of was that was quite surprising um i think i told you this before but i finished that five-day fast with dmt oh <laughs> that's the way to do it I had that plan uh, I think when I do the seven day fast, I'm gonna probably finish with a heroic dose of psilocybin mushrooms. Mm. That way, it's stretched out a bit longer. But that was, I mean, what was the DMT experience like what, what, compared to post five day water fast? That's some real. Sh that's some. That's some samurai shit, man. Yeah, you know the. It's funny because I had this total download on how we are electrical systems, and it was prior to reading the Body Electric or PMF. Both of those were sitting on my desk. I hadn't even opened the pages. And uh, the vision was very ayahuasca level. You know, it basically spoke to the consciousness of Mother Earth the entire time. Mm. And you know, for everybody that's 
has not experienced DMT or ayahuasca, obviously they're going to say, oh, the consciousness of Mother Earth. I think people listen to this um, are probably, they're past that. Yeah, uh, it was amazing. You know, I saw the Earth plane with nothing on it, just nature, and it was incredibly beautiful. And then um, buildings started being constructed without anyone there, and it started becoming more rapid and more rapid. What does thought, that look like? Buildings being constructed without they anybody just, there? They were like building themselves. Like, like, you know, the frame and the foundation would go up and then the walls and then the windows. And you're then having just a vision of this in front yeah, of you? Yeah, I was having a vision of this with my eyes closed. Interesting. Like DMT in like out in the middle of nowhere, like in the plains or, you know, in the jungle. Oh. Just seeing the earth being built on and, you know, uh, roads being made, all this stuff going and then accelerating exponentially. And then I kept, the more I fought it, the more it accelerated. So I'm like, I've already seen this. In ayahuasca, why are you showing me this again? I don't want to see it. I understand we're hurting you. And then it got worse, you know, and then all these people came out of nowhere and they were fucking mean to one another and everybody was fighting and fucking arguing. And, and, uh, and uh, so I asked, when was there a time where we lived in harmony with the earth? And I f- flew like an eagle down into South America into this giant, giant canopy and underneath this canopy of trees, there was this huge pyramid structure. And at the very top, there was a guy standing there who was completely tan and yoked. And uh, he had a giant bird, like a hawk face mask over his uh, forehead. But I could see his jaw and his nose with this giant beak. And then he had wings that stretched out several feet behind his arms. And he was dancing. And the dance was the vibration of DMT or ayahuasca. Like, I don't know if you had... Like it just vibrated that way. Like I recognized it instantly. Like, oh, I know this dance. Hmm. And I could feel it as he was dancing and stomping. And he sp- pulled this giant sword out and elect- lightning was shooting out of the top of it. He stuck it into the side of uh, the pyramid. It shot down into the earth, shot back up and then charged him with the electricity. And I was right then I was like, oh, okay. Let me read these books that I got right here. Whoa. And so that's been a driving factor in my research and and uh, guinea pigging with PMF devices and different things like that. And obviously, um, I forget the name of the book, but um, something about blue. Fuck. Something about blue, <laughs> but it's about the ocean. It's about experiencing the ocean. Like, why do we gravitate towards water? Blue Mind? Blue Mind, yeah. Yeah, I've had him on the podcast. Yeah, man. Yeah, Nicholas, exceptional, Wallace, right? Wallace Nichols. Uh-huh, Wallace Nichols, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I grew up in California in the Bay Area. I'd go to the ocean quite often. Anytime I'm back, I like to get in the water. And uh, there, there's a special feeling where you have there. It's palpable. You feel that. And then the research shows, you know, tons of negative ions, the charge, the grounding. You get that experience from that. So then if I live in Texas and I don't have access to that, how can I accomplish that feeling? Well, the biomat or this thing that we did today, um, you know, those are ways where we can get that extra level because just taking my shoes off can be beneficial to me and it can help me quiet my mind, but it's not necessarily as the same feeling as if I can accelerate the output of that, right? Whatever that frequency is, 7.83 hertz, Schumann resonance of the earth or lower, uh, you know, there's, there's ways through the technology that we can raise that power output and then that's palpable so 10 minutes on one of these machines can really leave you feeling better and they're not cheap but that's that's kind of the idea is where can i find this happy medium of something that is accessible to people that i can purchase and really have access to that every day i like how you said schumann with a jamaican accent <laughs> boy, <laughs> boy. <laughs> samson <laughs> simpson i'll stick to my story <laughs> Yeah, that's good. Um, so I'm curious with you. I think that there's a lot of um, maybe just there's a lot of information and misinformation around set and setting with using psychoactive substances. Mm-hmm. And you've kind of come a long way with your exploration into all that stuff. Do you have any kind of like recommendations for people that have maybe some curiosity around starting to explore something like that? Yeah, you know, I mean, uh, there's certain every... Pick a compound, any compound. So let's say mushrooms. Um, on the scale of dosing, they're wildly different experiences. You don't need a guide or a shaman for every experience. I think when you get into that heroic dose, five grams and up, it's important 
to have a guide or, or a sitter or a shaman to watch over you and guide you. Um, just because it's untraveled territory and terrain, you know, for people that have done that before, they might be like, oh, I can do that anytime I want. Well, yeah, you've got experience there. You know, I can do that anytime I want because I have experience there. Um, but with a microdose of those substances, like, yeah, you can be in public. I've spoken to cops on 200 micrograms of LSD, like, mm. and, and didn't even flinch. You know, I didn't feel anything awkward. I didn't sound awkward. I didn't behave awkward. And they didn't think anything of it. What is 200 micrograms? For? Twofold, two, two hits acid. Oh, man. So it You're was a good there. dose, you know, but, but the point is, it's not just like, let me fucking wave my skill set in the air. It's like, like there's a, uh. There's a time and a place for different uses. I think certain compounds like LSD can be incredible for celebration. You know, odds are if you see me at a wedding that I'm not drinking, I <laughs> just, might might be on just so you know. <laughs> LSD. That's 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 my drug of choice when I go out to celebrate someone else's marriage. Cool. I don't like being hungover. Um, and I can dance and it's very uplifting. It's not as grounding. Like, you know, mushrooms can go either way, even a microdose. Sometimes I just need to sit down or be in nature. Other times, uh, I feel light. I want to do yoga. I want to dance. I want to move. So that can go either way. LSD is definitely uplifting for me personally. And everyone has different neurochemistry. So that's where a little dabbling and a little trial and error can lead you to that. But having respect, setting an intention and knowing this isn't the only time you're going to do this. You know, people have this idea, like, like even with cannabis all the time, they're like, ah, I want to go deep. Let me try 20 mix. And it's like, well, you could have started with two, then five, then 10, then 20 to see where you're at. You know, don't blow the roof off right out the gate. Enter into this stuff, you know, go in the shallow end, swim a little bit, come back out next time, go in the mid level and then, then go deep for a little while. Yeah. And when you go deep, you know, having somebody there can be all the difference in the world and knowing like, am I okay? Am I safe? Yeah, you're fine. Oh, okay. And that's, that's all you needed to hear, you know? So, um, this other idea that I love that I like to tell people, I was listening to the Psychedelic Salon with Lorenzo Haggerty, and he was playing one of Terrence McKenna's lectures. And Terrence, uh, he opened it up for Q&A at the end. And they said, is there a wrong way to do psychedelics? And he said, yes, if you don't take enough. And mm, everyone laughed. I and I got it. And what it was, was, you know, in the, in, the, in the 1960s, the psychedelic 60s and the music and everything, everyone would go to these giant music festivals at Golden Gate Park or wherever. And they'd be drinking, they'd be smoking a little weed. Some guy would be floating around like a fairy, just dropping a little hit of acid in everyone's mouth, or they'd eat a couple mushroom caps. They'd be in conversation the whole time. There'd be a lot of stimulus coming in and they'd never really have an experience alone, right? And they'd never push the envelope to blow the rails off and dissolve the ego for a moment, mm. just to see what's back there. Sometimes you need to yank that curtain open to see what you hide from yourself. And I think, um, you know, he, his recommendation was at some point to do five grams of mushrooms alone in darkness or with a guide in darkness, but to not have conversation because as I'm acting outward right now, as I'm speaking to you, I'm not receiving shit. I'm not listening. I'm not listening to myself or to you because I'm going outward. Mm. Right. And that's an issue that people, I see it all the fucking time because there's comfort in trying to talk through it. Like, oh, I saw this thing and it makes me feel uncomfortable. Oh, that's okay. Let me tell you about that. You know, and people just get engaged in the psychedelic experience in conversation. Well, you're not receiving anything new there. You're wasting, excuse me, wasting your time. You're wasting the experience and what you could learn by having to dive deep through that. And something Rick Doblin told me was there is no bad trip. There's only hard experiences within the trip. Mm. You know, and that's something really to consider. Like if you had a trauma that you relive, that's because it's still there. It's showing you that to allow you to process it with new perspective and move past that. You're not seeing it again because it's trying to torture you. It's showing you that because you haven't released it yet. So whatever that may be, you know, I've, I've done ayahuasca with, um, with a veteran from the military and he rewatched his best friend get shot after he told him, the guy said, I'm not, you know, I don't want to go uh, I think I'm going to die. And he's like, no, I'm going to be front in line. You're not going to die. If anyone dies, it's me. Guy missed, sniper missed him and killed his buddy. He relived that experience in ayahuasca. Oh. Not fucking fun, but he had to release that, right? <laughs> and ultimately afterwards, he felt better having gone through that again and seeing it with new eyes. Uh, if you've been raped, odds are that's going to come up at some point. You don't, you know, it's not going to be every experience. The saying is you don't always get what you want, but you get what you need. 
and it'll come when you're ready for it. Mm. So I know people very close to me that had had some, you know, childhood traumas and did not experience any of that until 30 ceremonies in. You know, so it will come at the right time when you're capable. Uh, that may be the first time though. So understanding like like Rick said, um, if you if you think you're gonna take this substance to feel good, to get out of your head and just to experience life, and then it goes wiry on you, that's when you think it's a bad trip. But if you understand all possible outcomes going into it, it's really about knowledge and edu education. You know, and I think Jim Fadiman writing the Psychedelic Explorer's Guide is great because it outlines these things. And it also outlines what are the best ways to microdose. The protocol, you know, if you do it once, every day, your body will dumb it down very quickly and you'll need a lot more to microdose with. But if you wait and do it every fourth day, now your body, you've given your body enough time to process it so it doesn't build resistance to it. You know, So I think there's tons of information out there. If you're curious about it, read, learn for yourself, and then ultimately experiment mm. You know, and start small. But the biggest things that I've gathered from that, from the way I used to do stuff, when I was a punk kid in high school, just trying to get out of my head versus the way I do it now, um, is I set an intention. And whether that's a microdose or a fucking max effort, I know why I'm doing it, why, why I'm going to that, into that space. You know, I have an idea of things I wanna work on. Uh, I really focus on those things. I write them down, meditate on it prior. And then when I drop into that space, I, I have a, a center point to focus on, you know? And as the mind wanders, I can always circle back to that home base of, oh, these are the things that I really need to focus on and learn from. And as I do that, I generally will get much more than I asked for, but at least those things that I'm really have been on my mind and concerned with are the things that I can develop and work on and see things with new perspective and new eyes. Mm. Yeah, you mentioned in the last podcast on the, on the audit side, you mentioned Gabor Mate mm -hmm. a bit. And one of the things that I've been, I love him. He's also been on this podcast as well. So tune into that one. Uh, but he mentions that we're not living, we tend to not live things in the present moment, but we live things through the filter of the past. You know, so all the time as we're perceiving each other, as we're perceiving, you know, whatever the situation is, we're taking it through that, you know, the, that experience kind of gets, gets shifted a little bit from what, if we say you mentioned like being raped or I had, you know, you say it with like PTSD, someone drops a pen on the ground and you know yeah. it's a dude it's just a pen dropped <laughs> you know but it, from your filter that's the far end of the spectrum you perceive that in that way we're doing that the people that we consider more like normal that aren't taking medications or didn't go to war or something like that i think we're experiencing that same thing it's just our filters maybe aren't quite so at that far end yeah they're not quite as sensitive yeah you have less knee-jerk reaction or you don't show it physically even though you respond emotion but maybe at a deeper maybe tell them your level at a deeper <laughs> you know level you you are experiencing that and it's like we're so often i think we you know you could say like we're we're spending on a credit card you know instead of actually coming from from what we actually have and i think that's the longer that we live in that place of momentum that may not serve us and we keep on perceiving things from that filter that may not be serving us that's just a ongoing i think there's that aggregate and eventually you have to pay it yeah you know and so having that 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 bad trip it doesn't even need to be with a psychedelic it could be anything you know having that that rough experience that ends up you're scratching your your nose this makes me insecure about me thinking i have to Upper scratch my nose. we talked about this uh, earlier <laughs> And I'm gonna lick my mustache too. <laughs> but so what? So so with that though, it's feels as though we are governed by momentum, whether we realize it or not. And it is extremely medicinal, you could say, to have some type of spacious moment just to step away from that and witness your momentum. And it's something that we don't really have in our society. It's not built in. We're only built into turn the wheel. You know, so something like any type of, we mentioned Steve Kotler's book. Um, Stealing Fire. Yeah, Stealing Fire. Any type of ecstatic state. You know, I think plant medicine is one of them. And then laughing and dancing and fasting and all of that stuff. Just something to pull out of the fucking momentum. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I think that's incredibly important. And, and this kind of layers into something that I wanted to talk about as maybe the main, I shouldn't say the main because intention's big, but one of the main pieces in that is how you integrate this stuff into your life. Because I know plenty of people that show up to ayahuasca ceremonies 
and they haven't changed. There's nothing they've improved upon. They go through the same experiences. They're told the same things from ayahuasca and they, they, they're not growing from the experience. And that's because yeah. whatever you're shown, that's not the fucking thing that heals you. That's no plant is going to fix you. You got to fix you. You got to do the work necessary. You got to walk the walk and then do, as we talked about, you can't just know you got to do right. And so what are the daily practices that you can use to extrapolate that? Well, we have to push pause because we have this momentum you're talking about. If we don't push pause and this doesn't need to be psychedelics per se, but a float tank, a meditation practice, Tai Chi, Qi Gong, walking in nature, all the things that can give you space to be able to be comfortable and check in with what's going on inside. You'll never know where this stress is from if you keep going back to the TV, back to the radio, back to whatever next distraction is there. Being a workaholic, I gotta check my email. It's fucking 1030 at night. Why do you gotta check your email? Like mm -hmm. it's time to be winding down. We gotta focus on sleep hygiene. There's a priority to things. Set windows for yourself to work, windows for your personal time for, for movement, windows for your personal time to reflect inward. You know, and as we do that stuff and we create space for all the different avenues of what's important to us in life and what we need, that's when we get the most out of these things. Not only the most out of our psychedelic experiences, but the most out of life in general. Mm. Have you seen any benefit with some of the neurological? Scratch your nose again, Kyle. One more time. I'm giving it to you now. I might fucking run this every 30 seconds. <laughs> that's mere neurons. Every time Aaron begins that's to another, talk, I'm going to run another, my upper that's lip. That's another thing. Us uh, mirroring each other. Um, have you seen any, you probably got like some cute EEGs and such around seeing concussive damage from you getting smacked in the face in UFC. So Kyle's like a legit fucking warrior, UFC fighter slash I me mean, you've been warrior in all sorts of ways i see you as a warrior from a just like a consciousness standpoint as well by the way well thank you yeah. i like that I'll yeah take seriously that. It's, it's tight you like match that archetype really well um have you seen any kind of progress in that of brain change i haven't had uh i haven't had a brain scan since i fought okay um Oddly enough the times where i was concussed did not get one because i didn't want a longer layoff and the times when I was not concussed, uh, the last time I had an orbital fracture, they did want to take a look at it and see if there was inflammation in the brain because I fought in, in Nottingham, England, and I wanted to be able to fly home. And there's a high likelihood when you have an orbital fracture that they won't let you fly for like three months. So I would have been fucked. That means I could take a boat. Yeah, I could either ride a boat across the Atlantic to New York and then drive to the Bay Area across country, or I'd have to stay there you know, indefinitely with not a lot of cash having lost that fight. Yeah. Um, thankfully, when they did the scan, they said, hey, your, your inflammation isn't, it's, you know, you can fly home. So I was able to fly, but the brain looked fine. There wasn't uh, any signs of, of TBI or anything from that, you know. Mm. If there was, they didn't tell me. Now, I know for damn sure, I've felt cognitive slips. There's been times in between fights and kind of where I'd feel that was in between fights, I used to live this polarized way of living where in fight camp, I would read books, I'd meditate every day, do breath work, do all the recovery items, active recovery, movement, yoga, train like a madman. But I'd put it, you know, I'd work in just as much as I worked out and completely clean and sober. Then after the fight, I would be an, I'd eat like an asshole. I'd do all the bad drugs and just fuck my body up right because it was like oh it's a good boy for eight weeks or 10 weeks so now i have the, the right to eat like shit and treat yeah. my body like shit and um i noticed very quickly that the fights that took the most damage when i'd go eat gluten and i have a gluten intolerance or get hammered drunk like that whole week i wouldn't be able to think clearly you know i couldn't i'd, I'd become forgetful i'd be what were we talking about yeah you know what I'm saying? I'd fucking stop mid-sentence and just drop and have no clue what we were on. Not even the last word. Like, uh, like I couldn't even reframe re where I was coming from and backtrack. And so those are the first sign. This was when I was maybe 30, like early 30s. I retired when I was 32. So 30, 31, 32. 37 now? 30. 35. I'll 35. Be 36 oh, so sorry. Much. 35. 41 telomere age. 41 telomere age. <laughs> I averaged. Right. I did the median. You did. You did the middle. <laughs> Thank you. I feel fucking four years younger already. 
<laughs> I see what you're doing there. Is that a little NLP? I'll try to NLP you. <laughs> By the end of this podcast, yeah. you're going to say I'm 34. Yeah, we're, I'll take we're, it. we're guiding. You're 34, Wearing, right? Wearing, guiding. Yeah, we're yeah. leading out of darkness yeah, That's into when the you light. keep scratching your goddamn lip. Yeah, it's brother. You're, you're NLPing me, making my, <laughs> making, my lip, making my lip itchy. But we, uh, you know, it was funny to live that way. And, and uh, it was actually ayahuasca that showed me that. Like I had a vision after my first time doing ceremony after my final fight i asked like why did i want to why did i have to fight again you know if, I, if it's not important to me anymore which was the ultimate understanding fighting has to be the mo most important thing you do or else you're going to lose and when i was right. in the fight i was like this is not important to me anymore this is my last fight and um obviously i'd been working with plant medicines at that time and that really became something that was more important and wanting to take better care of myself not getting hit in the head for pennies you know fucking peanuts yeah. table scraps so you know in, in in that experience i got to see how i lived in camp how good i felt i felt good when i saw how i was in camp i felt the peace of meditation mm. i felt the 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 raw energy and charge from doing breath work and then i felt fucking miserable and depressed drinking and eating like shit and the tiredness and sunkenness and then i would fucking purge it out and get rid of that feeling and it just showed me like i don't have to have a fight coming up to want to live better to want to do better for myself and to really put these things that i know into action where i am acting on what i know and doing and walking the walk and living the dream and so really that's that's been one of the biggest shifts in my life is you know in 2014 uh, summer of 2014 moving forward that way can you break down a, a a meditation practice that you'd use before a fight, or maybe maybe if it's evolved now, like what would you, you know, use it's now? It's completely evolved. Sure I know you've had Paul check on the show before, and yeah. we had him out here at on it. Um, just a fucking wizard, you know. It's funny when I first read How to Eat, Move, Me Healthy, I read the Qigong section and laughed at it. I was like, I don't need this shit. And uh, later on, I was working with a sports psychologist who was teaching me breath work so I could calm my mind before a fight. And then I reread How to Eat, Move, Me Healthy. I saw that and I was like this is in here this really it's in he calls them zone exercises that's to water it down they're matching the chakra system right because he doesn't want to piss off christians and people that aren't okay with learning about chakras so he oh. called them the zones but uh you go through zone one through six and you do different matched breathing and you're you're balancing your energy system as you do this it you feel different it's like wim Hof says feeling is believing you know so i got into that stuff and then having him out here he just showed me this general flow of tai chi that it doesn't have to be this perfect practice you know you inhale as the arms move away from the body and you exhale as the arms come back into the fetal position that can be above head inhale moving up exhale moving down that can be straight out in front of you inhale moving out exhale moving back in you can take a step in either direction as you're doing this with the arms, tongue placed to the roof of the mouth, jaw nice and loose. And if you, if your if your tongue gets dry, that means you're shifting into sympathetic. That means you need to take a few deep breaths, reset yourself, and start again. You're working out too hard. Hmm. If you sweat, that means you're working too hard. If your tongue stays moist and wet, and if you're not sweating and you feel calm and relaxed, you're doing it right. Those are the only things you need to pay attention to as you do it. And really, as long as, I mean, that has been one of the absolute game changers for me because there's a lot of times where I feel if I have anxiety or um, sometimes it takes action for me to de-stress and decompress. And that's a beautiful way to use movement as a part of meditation. And there's a reason that so many people do Tai Chi, you know, but yeah. I'm used to seeing a bunch of old Asian people in Cupertino, California do it. And I never understood it until I actually embodied and felt what they're going through. Like, I was like, oh, I fucking get it now. Yep. And that's been an absolute game changer. I can pop outside and on it, kick my, and I'll never wear shoes here, but I'll go in the grass, I'll get my grounding on, rip my shirt off and just hit five minutes, 10 minutes. And it's a complete reset. It's sometimes that's more effective and efficient than doing 45 minutes in a dark, quiet room, which I still love to yeah. do as well. Yeah. I, something that is probably, I think a big part of, uh, people's resistance or fear around psychoactive substances i i'm always weird about what to call plant medicine or psychedelics or whatever whatever infusions infusions yeah god. yeah to go into god all of it's weird we gotta like, plant medicine works i guess that's good um so with that though for one thing it's that kind of like 
in a sense, you're kind of like burning the bridge, you know? So you're go- going in, it's like going into battle and you're like, okay, once you go in, you're in. <laughs> you know, there's no, maybe there are some some things that you can do to kind of pull you out a little bit, but it's like that fear of like, I don't really want to burn the bridge. Like this, this consciousness, this kind of structure that I've built here, I'm not so sure that I want to step away from that for four to six hours or whatever it is. Do you have any type of, and correct me if you feel like that's not like an appropriate analogy, but um, do you have any type of practices or, or kind of like coaching around, say someone does step into that experience and uh, all of a sudden things start getting scary? Yeah. So that's, that's a, this is something that has come up quite a bit and it's, it's the way you worded it is perfect. Cause I've met plenty of people that I've when I first got into this stuff, I wanted to fucking preach the gospel. Like everyone needs to do this. Why won't you do this? You know? And then later on, it's like, okay, everyone gets to walk their own path. Yeah. It's not for everyone. If you can't be comfortable in your own skin and meditation, you've got no business fucking doing that. And mm. I, I said this on mind pump before that, you know, somebody walks into the gym and they're like, uh, cause mind pump, they all used to be personal trainers at 24 hour fitness. They're like, Oh, I want to be, you know, I want a better ass. We should do barbell squats. It's the best exercise for barbell squats. And like, okay, sure. Do an air squat. Oh, you can't do an air squat. Cause your hip impingement and your mm. knees fucked up. You don't have the right to use the barbell yet. We got to get you up to a certain baseline, right? You must be this tall to go on this ride, hmm. right? Then you can use the barbell. You got to graduate to get to there. There's prerequisites, right? Hmm. And I think having some form of and I say this, this is odd. I didn't meditate much before psychedelics. Psychedelics taught me how to meditate. Yeah. But being comfortable in your own skin and being comfortable with, with you know, the unknown, seeing some things that you may not be prepared for and knowing that whatever's buried dark and deep from your past could come up. As long as you're okay with that and you have some general ability to quiet your mind and find peace and relaxation, I think you're ready to go on the big ride. You know, And that's personal opinion, obviously, but... Um, in the experience, one of the best things to do is to focus on the breath. So if you're seeing something that's uncomfortable to slow your breathing back down, you know, we, we spoke about this early on, on it, we have the ability to reverse engineer our sympathetic state into a parasympathetic state simply by slowing our breathing down. And I use a four count in eight seconds out as just a very easy twice as long exhale as, as inhale. And that can reverse some of that. It may not change the vision, but it may be more palpable. Mm. Uh, Another common one is to change the song or to leave the room, to go into a different room. You know, so if you change the environment, uh, however minute that may be, that can have a big impact. Um, You know, a lot of people will go outside on the back patio for a minute till, you know, get a breath of fresh air and then come back inside and lay back down and continue to take things in. Um, But you know, the more comfortable you are with, I mean, it's, it's, it really is about easing into it and then having experience because there's been plenty of different ceremonies where I went through a lot of work on childhood stuff and, uh, different things that I had done that I had guilt for that I had to release and forgive myself for. And they all came at different times. It's not like I had the kitchen sink thrown at me all at once. What does that look like? Um, like a, like feeling guilt for a thing and releasing the thing. Fuck man. It was tough. Uh, Well, I'll say this and it'll probably make a lot of people not like me, but (laughs) probably not. When I I was in college, I had an English Mastiff that I absolutely fucking love. She, she lived till she was nine. She weighed 170 pounds. She always used to eat the trash and uh, you know, pre psychedelics, pre any self work. um, I came home and saw that she had fucking just dumped all the trash out and eaten everything. And so I beat my dog Mm. and I never did it again. Uh, She wasn't, she didn't, she wasn't hurt. I didn't fucking thrash. It was pre UFC. It's not like I was throwing soccer kicks and shit like that, but I fucking held a lot of guilt. I'm getting welled up right now. Just talking about it. And in ayahuasca, I got to do (laughs) that very same thing over again Mm. and feel her pain like to feel my dog getting hit from me just fucking blew me away you know and i had that i had that guilt ever since doing it but i would stuff it down 
I wouldn't let it come to the surface. And then in reliving that, you know, it was just, fuck, man, I, I just, pure waterworks, you know, I had to let go of that. I had to cry and release that. And in that, I had to forgive myself for that and apologize to her to tell her how much I love her. And then I'm sorry, deeply sorry for doing that. Mm. But after that, I mean, it felt like a weight had been lifted, you know? And it's something I didn't even know was there. This was from years ago. Um, I was probably 20 years old. And I don't think I got into ayahuasca until I was 28, maybe, 29. You know, she had already passed away. Or, no, she hadn't passed away. But, yeah, you know, there's there's just, we carry shit with us from fucking forever. I mean, just stuff sticks to us like glue. And unless we actively work to see where that comes from, um, you, we might have an experience and think, like, I'm over that. I'm cool, you know, but it's still there. I mean, a lot of these people that have been raped or have had childhood trauma they go to therapy and they think I'm good with that. And then why does it still come up in the ceremony? Well, there's at least a piece of this that you're not good with. There's a piece of this where everything seemed good on paper with a therapist, but you didn't get rid of it. You didn't release it. And for me, that was certainly the case, you know, but I mean, this can be anything. It could be one experience like that. It could be a number of experiences, but we walk with the, we carry all this with us, you know, and it's heavy. And it affects how we interact with other people. We get triggered to you as a word from the left. We get these, we get these, these raw emotional things that just make us snap into a knee-jerk reaction, right? Somebody said this thing that really drives me crazy. And um, and I take out the whole weight of the universe on them. I take out 20 years of anger and pain on them mm. for the one comment because I haven't released that. I haven't worked through those things. And I think that's been one of the great, I mean, there's plenty of my family members that'll never do this stuff, but at the very least, they see the way that I live. They see the way that I feel, the way that I talk, the way that I operate. And that can be all the change that they need. Hmm. You know, that can be all that, that is the gift for them. You know, my, my thought originally was how do I get them to do this so they can gain all the perspective that I'm gaining. And ultimately that's not the answer. The answer is for me to do the work on myself and in that, I'm the best version of me for my wife, for my children, for my friends and my family, and for every dog that I have from now on, you know? Yeah. I've kind of been playing with the, the idea of, it's almost like maybe they don't need to do this because you're doing this. Yeah. yeah. I got that. I got that in a ceremony. Of my, I was thinking about my sister so much. She's a year younger than me. And for years, I was just begging in ceremony, like, please, how do I get my sister to do this? And uh, it's funny because I saw myself, this was in Colombia, I saw myself drinking till I threw up from age 13 until 33, mm. you know, and how she's one year younger than me looking up to her big brother and she has all these memories of me just fucking up. You know, so sure to her, if I say, hey, this drug's different, this is fucking, it's amazing. It's totally different. Well, of course, there's some resistance. Of course, there's disbelief. But um, ultimately, it was, I had this idea like, oh, she doesn't need a drink. I'll drink for both of us. Hmm. Like, I'll learn for both of us. And the things that I learned, these, like, like Paul Selig says, truth is truth for all existence. It never changes. What is true now will be true for millennia. It never changes, right? Any at any any time in history, if we see a, a truth, and truth is synonymous with God and love, that truth doesn't change. It may change the wording a little bit, but it's still true, right? And so, if I live better, and I have these ways that I can show my love and be authentic with her, and be have a little bit more compassion and gratitude for her, and to to not judge her and her in her place, where she, wherever she's at, that's a better way to live than needing her to come join me in, in my practice. Yeah. You know, I can give it to her in different ways. Yeah. It's like, uh, our intention towards changing other people. It's almost like that's our own work towards letting go of changing ourselves. And just, you know, there's a John D Martini. I just did a, a thing with him and went to a little workshop and had him on the podcast and all that stuff. Really super, super interesting guy. Um, one of the things that 
he mentioned was anything that you can forgive is energy and anything that you can't forgive is, is baggage. Or I think maybe it's anything you forgive is fuel, whatever that, that meaning. And it's just an interest. This is just coming to me right now, but it's just interesting kind of thought of like, like Gaia type idea. Like we're all in this bubble together and you have a role like you, like I had mentioned with you, you strike me as like warrior archetype and you have other things other than that. Let me like put that on you. Um, you know, but it's like, cool, fulfill that, you know, and then someone else that's like, I'm an accountant, <laughs> you know, I really like running the numbers, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's like you, do, they don't need to be an ecstatic dancing, psychedelic, you know, wearing a kilt at a wedding. Like, like they don't need to be that abstract. Like they, they fulfill s- something that's really important. You know, they show up one time and they get it done. <laughs> you know, it's like we, we as, as from, or we, whatever, whatever the hell I fall into, uh, it's just, I think, just like focusing on just being the best that you possibly can from where you're at and not getting distracted by all the bullshit of like what I need to impose upon other people. All of a sudden, it feels yeah. like that almost might let go of some psychic way. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, 100%. I agree with that entirely. What do you think? Like, obviously, we've walked similar paths in going down the rabbit hole with our own consciousness and altered states. Have you felt a divide or any kind of friction as you've grown and kind of um, disrobed from typical modern life into what you would consider to be important for yourself now and then how your family lives? Like, yeah. I think I'm still in the process of disrobing all sorts of shit, firstly. And, um, you know, but with that, something that, because you're only in your own bubble. And so what I find is when I'm in my own bubble, I think all this shit's normal. You know, so it's like, yeah, of course you have a freaking turkey freezer in your garage and you sit in it for eight minutes and listen to spiritual sex talks and then go for a jog in your <laughs> underpants barefoot while you're conscious of grounding and then, you know, put on your binaural beats and then a fuck it. Like, it's like, yeah, duh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, what else would you do? <laughs> you know, and then you go back to Lancaster, Pennsylvania, where I came from, and it's like, oh, this is like there's nothing nothing's changed mm. we're still playing beer pong no mm. there's anything wrong with beer pong you yeah know? you know but it's like we're still playing nhl 99 and playing beer pong yeah hey i get that you know when i go to this bachelor party i got bachelor parties that i go to once or twice a year with pretty much the same core group of friends that i grew up with it's all the same shit i'll try to incorporate different drugs like lsd and things like that into my equation nobody else really joins me because i just don't want to get shit faced on alcohol for five days straight yeah but yeah it's beer pong it's reminiscent about the good old days and things like that i think one thing that i've gotten on it's, it was easier for me with my friends than my family but when i look at my friends i've realized i can love them for the things that i love about them i don't need to see them make changes because i still yeah. i fucking love laughing with those guys they make me laugh harder than anyone on earth and it's talking about stupid shit and and I'll fucking still turn inside out laughing with them. So I don't need them to change. I don't need them to eat a certain way. I don't need them to fucking work out or take like all that shit is there if they want it. Like some people ask me, they got a wedding coming up. They want to drop pounds. Pick my brain all you want. Mm-hmm. And if you go back to being fat after that, that's totally fine. Live your right. life wherever you want. But I really enjoy being around them for the things that I enjoy and I don't need more than that. Yeah. I think that was a big take home for me with friends. One thing I was I was getting from the the talk with the the, the spirit sex stuff while I was in the in your freezer was um, he was talking about something I've noticed is as I start to become more kind of attentive to consciousness and things of that nature just like balancing out my heart like not protecting myself so much you know and that making the condom off your heart take the condom off the heart yeah or at least get like a lamb skin or something (laughs) 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 so but as as i'm starting to become a little bit more aware of like oh yeah i kind of do lead with like a little bit more ego like a like a protective coat you know or i do lead with my dick or i do lead with my intellect or i do lead with my muscles or i do lead with all these different just protective mechanisms that's all they are you know, and what those are as you build those, it's kind of like you're you're building them because there's like a scared boy underneath that that you want to protect. Mm. You know, as you can start to dissolve some of that, you can start to come to kind of more of a congruency with that scared boy and the muscles and the dick and the ego. 
and it can just be kind of like coming to like, oh, okay, cool. We're kind of, we're here together, you know? And as I, I'm, I'm tinkering with some of that, uh, what I'm noticing is it's like, oh, it's evolving the people that are in my world. It's evolving the women that I attract. I happen to be attracting women. You know, I went for a while where it's like, I fit into a stereotype of like a decent looking guy you know, but I wouldn't. I wouldn't necessarily. You're a good-looking guy, buddy. You <laughs> I got would, it. I wouldn't necessarily attract the people that I was like attracted to. Mm. You know, so girls that I was, I was, you know, indifferent towards, they'd be like, "Oh, cool, like, yeah, great." But the ones that felt like a connection, there's like, mm. there's this block there. You know, and it's it's been interesting that I'm, I'm noticing as I'm starting to feel into my heart. Um, all of a sudden I'm starting to feel more congruent relationships start to come as well. And that was something that I was listening to my spirit sex talk this morning in your turkey freezer. It's not a turkey freezer. I don't know why I keep calling it that. Um, was that something that we do with like, he was, the guy was relating to like, you're in the CEO position and you're looking for a man that, you know, loves you for your, you know, your deeper parts of yourself, but he just wants to fuck. And you just keep attracting these fuck boys. It's like, well, you never took your CEO helmet off. Mm. <laughs> you know, and so in order to attract what you actually want to bring in to kind of complete this circle for whatever the heck it is that you want to create, you first have to take off, take off the helmet. That was kind of a out there, out there rant, but I don't even know. That's not a question. It's just something I'm noticing as I'm, as I'm starting to feel, um, my own self start to come at more peace with myself, which it's still a process. I notice more. So you took off the CEO helmet in. and you have less fuck boys to deal with. Now all of a sudden, yeah, I'm uh, I got less fuck boys knocking at my door. That's not the way to end the podcast. <laughs> 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 I'll probably have to short that shorten that rant down a little bit. <laughs> no, don't fucking edit this. Do you do you feel that though? Is that something that you you've noticed with like I've I've things noticed things coming in differently. Yeah, there's no doubt. And you know, it's funny cuz as anytime anytime we talk about these things, it, ultimately there's the knee jerk reaction of, "Well, the secret, it's bullshit." You know, like, yeah, you can't wish for certain things and that's not the law of attraction. You still have to do it. You still have to go through with it. But what you align to, and this is something that I really found fascinating with Joe Dispenza talking about and breaking the habit of being yourself. It's not enough. The universe doesn't respond to, or God or consciousness, whatever you want to call it, great spirit. It doesn't respond to just thoughts or just emotion. It responds when everything's in alignment. Hmm. Linetherapy.com. Line podcast. A line podcast. <laughs> and when you when your when your when your thoughts and your prayer or your mindset, your meditation is in align with your heart and your energy and your emotions, that's when you see things start to shift because you're yeah. clear on what you want. And and it may just be that becoming clear for you personally, like we talked about before, any anyone who knows their how will figure out their why. Anybody who knows her why will figure out their how. That's right. I fucked it up again. Two, two for two. Two for two. <laughs> <laughs> you can everyone... tune into the audit podcast and you're <laughs> fucking up over there. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So anybody who knows their why will figure out the how. They'll figure out how to get it done, right? So I think I think when you understand that and everything's in alignment on is it something you really want? Is it something that you really need? It's not just a desire like, God, I want this new Tesla. Mm -hmm. It's That's a little bit different than... I'd like to have a home instead of this garage that I live in with my family right now. Yeah. You know, and to see how that happened over the course of 2017 for me was directly a shift in consciousness on what I thought I was capable of and how I thought I was going to get it. Hmm. And ultimately that the one of the biggest take homes from psychedelic ceremonies and my practice has been trust. And it's not just blind faith that everything will work out and the shit will show up on my doorstep. It's I can, it's kind of like um, in Indiana Jones when he's got to cross the bridge, but it's invisible. And every time he takes a step, he sees the brick show up oh, underneath his foot. Yeah, right. Sometimes you got to take the step forward when you don't Good. see shit and you'll fucking land with sure footing, hmm. right? And that's been one of the biggest practices for me is I may fuck up and that's okay, but I'm going to take those steps towards the things that I want in life and I may not know the outcome until I've gotten there. And then I need to redirect or back out and go a different route. But it's the movement forward that makes this shit happen. And I think that's that's been all the difference in the world for me in the past year and a half. Mm. That's how you end a podcast. Uh. Uh.
<clears throat> Mine was bullshit in comparison to that. You just nailed that. You just <laughs> summated all the nonsense that I, I spouted out. How do people learn more about your stuff and get get dialed in in the, the well, audience slash personally, Kyle world? Yeah, personally, I'm, um, I think I'm maxed out on Facebook users because I never switched over to a... Oh, you got to do that. Yeah, it's I never did that. Um, Start now. But Kyle you know, Kingsbury at Facebook. We're going to change that up. We're going to sort that shit let's out. Short, let's sort it out tonight. <laughs> but at Kingsboo, K-I-N-G-S-B-U on Twitter and Instagram, I'm much more vocal there. Uh, and then every Wednesday night, 6 p.m. Central, I do Facebook Live through on its main page. So you just go to on it at Facebook, you click like, and then you can watch the Facebook Live. It's a 30 minute QA. We talk all things from psychedelics, meditation, consciousness, supplements, weightlifting, fat loss, muscle gain, any of the bare bones basement bullshit that everyone wants to hear about, all the way to some of the weirder fun shit that I'm into. Mm. And um, uh, obviously, you know, you can listen to the On It podcast, which I host. We release a new one every Monday. Uh, my boy, Aaron Alexander, is going to be a glorious guest. I don't think you're going to air till the end of April, oddly enough. Perfect. Unfortunately, but... We'll put this out at the same time. Okay. So, so Perfect, brother. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's that's basically it. Am I missing anything? No, I don't have a website. But you can go to onit.com if you want to get any cool supplements. Use uh, code word podcast at checkout for a nice discount. Cool. Yeah, brother. If anybody cares about my opinion, uh, if there's anyone that I vouch for, it would be Mr. Kyle. It's got to be Kyle. So, Mr. Kyle. Mr. Kyle. So check his shit out. Keep following him. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you, brother. Appreciate it. Yes. That was an excellent experience. I always learn a lot about myself here. All right. Bam. Wrap it up.